Good evening everyone. Thank you for returning again for this next uh, instalment of my uh, ECA uh, shifts, which I've been doing recently. Okay, last night um, I had a, uh, what was it, 7am uh, to 10pm shift, uh, quite close by to me in Christchurch. The main, I suppose the main focus of those shifts um, was to do with falls. Now, just to, just to clarify, um, it's quite strange that you would go out and most of the, um, the, the call-outs are maybe for cardiac or on the another night another call-out is, is to do with chest pains or falls or something. It's just the way it is. For some reason, I seem to have a, um, uh, I can't think of the word at the moment, um, I seem to be having a, um, a run of um, independent but similar problems every time I go out. So anyway, on this occasion, um, the, main, the main problems were falls um, and elderly people falling. Now, when we go to a, a fall, um, the first thing that comes into mind before you even get there is you know, how old they might be, do they slip, trip or fall? You know, what was the mode of, you know, do they sip in water, do they fall over their shoelaces, <coughs> did they fall because of their um, losing consciousness, you know, all these things we have to ask the patient when we, when we get there, because that we know what's the reasoning behind the fall. When also we get there, we'll see how they've landed, you know, how long they've been on the floor for. So um, if they've only just physically fallen down quite heavily um, over the last sort of 10 minutes, um, you know, that, that's, that's still bad, but there haven't been prolonged time on the floor. Um, and if people have been giving them water and covering them up and helping them out, that also helps. But if someone's been on the floor for five, six, seven, eight hours, um, it can build up toxicity in the body because when you lay on your body, I lay on the floor for a long period of time, especially when you're older, um, the toxins in the body start forming up, um, bruising and everything else, and it actually it's very, very bad. So more than two hours on the floor unaccompanied without even knowing anyone else around you is an automatic um, trip to the hospital just to check them out. Um, so the two main ones I seem to remember from yesterday um, is one was a gentleman which um, lived alone um, and uh, he had called, I think he called this care button or something um, and we found him um, out of his bed with a cover over the top of him and his trousers underneath his head to, to keep him, you know, be more comfortable. So what we found was that he had slipped out of his bed by picking something up from the, from, from the, the floor and wasn't able to come up again because he was in so much pain. His um, wife, I believe it was his wife, found him a couple of hours later and said that usually, uh, no sorry, excuse me, his daughter, no, his, that's right, they were, they were daughter-father um, relationship. His daughter said that she had found him and he doesn't usually complain which is a bonus thing so we know what his usual pain threshold is. And this gentleman was in a lot of pain. I mean, he was sort of 65, 70 years old. In a lot of pain. Um, he had dementia as well, which didn't really help because it can hide or exacerbate certain things. Um, and he was um, saying that there was a lot of pain in his shoulder, a lot of pain in his hip. And he was flat on the ground. The reason why he was flat on the ground with his cover of him is because he just pulled the cover over himself because he was cold. And um, his trousers happened to be there, so he put them on his, under his head. But his, his um, daughter hadn't done that. So you know, all this is part of the story that we need to put onto our information to give to the hospital. And he's been there for, for two or three hours. So the, um, the mechanics of the fall is unknown, but we know that he's been there for a few hours. When we examined him, we did the usual primary survey, and he was talking to us, we knew his airway was open. Um, he had a black eye on one of his, you know, one of his eyes, and he was quite poorly all the way down one side. So we think he fell quite heavily on one side, 
when we tried to lift him up onto a sitting position, um, he became very, very upset um, and, and in the way of obviously pain. So we knew there was a problem there as well. Um, he was only able to stand on one leg, so we knew there was a problem on the other side. Um, and we couldn't really see any problems physically on the outside, even with palpitations, even by pressing. But he was covering one area up, and he was complaining also of uh, hip or leg problems. So in the end, what we did was actually we had to um, uh, take him out um, by stretcher into into the vehicle and, and take him to hospital. Um, now we had to check whether we should go to one hospital or another because one hospital would have taken him. Um, unless we knew he had a broken bone or not. If he had a broken bone, he had to go to the other hospital. So um, the thought was, treat it as they had a broken bone, and if it, if it wasn't a broken bone, then that was no problem. If it was a broken bone, we took him to the wrong hospital, he would have to have another vehicle take him back to the broken bone for his age, and you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the specialists for that sort of bone would have been there anyway. Um, so this is all poor thinking. Um, so as it turned out, he had a broken scapula, which is the back of your shoulder blade, and also a um, um, head of the femur, which is the top of your hip that goes into the slot, um, broken bone there. So we had a good call with that. Um, and uh, to help him with his pain, we originally gave him Gatineau or Entinox, um, and after that we gave him a cannula and um, the, past, the um, paramedic gave him some morphine, which I drew up. So I put the, the morphine in, into, the, um, into the syringe with um, the sodium chloride solution as well, and then <clears throat> handed it to the paramedic, and then they actually um, gave him the, the dose, because I'm not allowed to physically give the dose in a moment to be an MCA, but you can actually help and assist the, the, um, the paramedic by preparing the drugs for the uh, application. And uh, the other one I remember um, quite clearly was uh, an old lady, um, and uh, she was a very charming lady. Um, she was 92 years old. She had a wonderful, wonderful French accent, which sometimes got in the way because I couldn't understand some of the English words that she was saying. And um, we found her in the bathroom, she was laying on the floor, she had slipped from the, going from the, from the toilet um, and she couldn't get up and she was in a lot of pain as well. And um, it was a very difficult situation in a way to try to extract her from that bathroom floor because it was so confined. Um, she was breathing fine, no problems with cardiac, um, but the problem was to try and turn her from a half um, lying on a side position to a, a lying down flat position to be able to extract her from that bathroom floor. Now, put it this way, she had a lot of pain down from one side of her leg. Okay, um, It was very, very swollen and it was uh, very, very bruised. So what do you think? Could be a broken bone. Because we couldn't physically get her up, physically get her to sit up or move herself, we had to use other things like um, blankets to pull her into a, into a flat position. Um, I had to hold her leg and her, her thigh <coughs> um, as, as, as easy as I could whilst uh, the other paramedic then moved her body and her bottom to a more flat position. And this was extraordinarily painful for her. So um, we gave her, of course, Entinox, but we also gave her morphine as well, which sort of worked um, because the pain was so, so bad. Um, we then in decided to put her leg into traction, um, which basically means that you are trying to flatten out the, the, the bone or the, the leg and hold it in place with a metal splint. Um, this traction device it has a little hook in one end which comes underneath the foot and it's like a, a bar that comes into two separate pieces and joined by Velcro. Um, so if you imagine the foot is there, it's joined 
from here to here and here is where your hip is. So keep your legs straight. Um, in order to keep it straight, we have to pull the leg straight, which then pull the bone straighter. So if you can imagine a broken bone up by your thigh, and then think about the pain, and then think about the age of this lady at 92, and you could probably imagine that she wasn't very comfortable, even with morphine and Entomax. She was a fantastic patient though, <laughs> she kept on apologising her screaming, which kind of blew my ears sometimes, but you know, you're expecting that as well. And we had to apologise for her to, you know, to keep her legs straight. Anyway, so um, that was then finished off, and the traction was very, very tight, so it was actually biting into her um, skin, so we had to be, make sure we had to put it on and then get out and out of there as soon as possible, because otherwise it's going to end up with a tourniquet, which means it's going to um, uh, stop the blood from going through the leg. Um, the other thought we had was, how are we going to take her out of the small bathroom? Now, if you think about the bathroom that she was in, she was just about big enough lying down to cover the bathroom floor, okay? Um, and there's no way we could have got her into a chair, and there's no way we could have got a bed um, stretcher in there. So we have something that's called a scoop, okay? And basically, it's a, uh, a surfboard, which is connected at the top and the bottom. And what you do is you place one side of the scoop underneath the person and then put the other one underneath the person and then click at the top and click the bottom and then you can lift them up completely. So you don't actually have to move the person at all by you know, trying to break more, more bones. And that really worked. So we scooped her up, turned her around and put her into the, um, onto the trolley. And then back on the trolley we then reassessed her put her onto the, onto the vehicle and then take her to the hospital. Um, the hospitals are usually quite busy, so only um, we still had a, a, a bit of a wait, like half an hour, 45 minutes. And this lady, poor thing, she was in a lot of pain and um, the morphine was wearing off. So by the time we got to her, she was almost screaming the um, hospital down. But she did say thank you at the end, which was quite good. And yes, she had a broken bone top of her femur and a grey um, fracture of her um, pelvic um, girdle, which is your pelvis area, um, which we don't really know if that was the case or not, because we could stay there too long to see the x-ray. Um, so that was, that was really, really interesting. Basically, using all the equipment available to us. Um, if we can't get people up, then we we'll use um, things like a, a banana board or we we'll use a um, grab sheets or whatever. Oh, my snake is awake. <laughs> That's midnight, by the way. Um, and, uh, yeah, sorry, you put me off. <laughs> um, so we have some a lot of equipment on board to help us uh, extract patients, you know, in any sort of situation. Um, and if we can't do it ourselves, then we ask other forces, like the fire brigade or something, to give us a hand. But generally, we do try to to do it ourselves. Um, so yeah, so yesterday was quite a, an interesting one. My colleagues finished work at 9 o'clock in the evening, left me for one hour on my own. So that means I had to then book on as a solo ECA on a frontline vehicle. That doesn't mean to say that they wouldn't have called me. Luckily for me, they didn't because I was only tired anyway. Um, but it's possible to get called for a solo uh, caller as an ECA. Um, you could be backing up a paramedic in a car, that sort of thing. So don't think that um, if that happens, you're on your own, you're not. Okay. If that happens, you have got radio, you have got backup, you have got paramedics who will come out to you. you know, if you're not sure about something, then you always ask. And that's one of the biggest things ever as an ECA, or I suppose in any sort of job. It's always best to ask questions and to try and remember the answers and then ask again if you can't remember those answers. Because if you don't answer those questions, mm -hmm. you could actually put someone's life in jeopardy. Um, it may sound silly to you thinking, oh, this is a silly question, maybe I should ask that. But it, at the end of the day, if it's going to save someone's life, 
um, then you'd ask it. And I've asked a lot of questions. I've asked questions in my training. I've asked, I've asked so many more questions actually on the road. And I'm not embarrassed about it because if I don't know, then how am I going to help somebody? You know. So, um, yes, yeah, so this weekend I'm free. I'm going to try to catch up some sleep. And then next weekend I've got some really early shifts, sort of sixes, starts. Um, I think I'll get a five o'clock start as well. So uh, we'll see how that one goes. All right, so as usual, leave your comments um, below and uh, thank you for watching. I'm sorry about the um, the noise on my computer. I don't know what the problem is. I think it's just something to do with the, um, the, the microphone on here. Um, and I can't sort it out any further than that, so my apologies. But um, have a good weekend. Stay safe, drive carefully, and I'll uh, catch you next week. Take care. Bye.